White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. Welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Good morning. It's good to be here. Well, as you just heard Mike report, uh, the, apparently the number that congressional negotiators are talking about is somewhere between 1.3 and $2 billion at the most. In any case, less than half the $5.7 billion the president wants for new border barriers. Will the president sign a deal at that number? I have to laugh because I've heard those numbers. I've also heard zero for a border barrier or wall. 800 million was a number I've heard. I've also heard 2.5 or 2.6. And I'm looking forward to actually watching the interview after I'm off of this show because I just don't know where the Democrats are. And I think that's a reflection, Chris, of, of where their party is. I don't think they know where they stand on this particular issue. And that's one of the reasons I think we're having a difficulty coming to a deal. To you, answer your question, uh, the president is going to build the wall. You saw that. You saw what the vice president said there, and that's that's our attitude at this point, which is we'll take as much money as you can give us, um, and then we will go off and find the money someplace else legally in order to secure that southern barrier. But this is going to get built with or without Congress. Okay, so I want to unpack, because you said a lot of stuff there. You're saying he'll take whatever the congressional negotiators give. Are you, you're saying then that if they agreed, let's take a, the number that's been mostly reported, $2 billion, he will sign that bill and then try to find more money? A, a couple of different things. I'm not saying what the president will or won't sign, because keep in mind, there's a lot of things that, uh, that don't get discussed, which is what else is in the bill. Um, you could give a number that the president might like, but take away something else that he doesn't like. I was talking with Senator Shelby. I understand a, a new issue has come up just in the, in the last couple of hours that he's going to discuss with you in a couple of minutes regarding detention beds. So there's going to be a lot of different moving pieces. So I'm not in a position to say the president will absolutely sign or will, will not sign. Here's what we do know. The president has to sign a piece of legislation in order to keep the government open. He cannot sign anything that they put in front of him. Just excuse me. They cannot sign everything they put in front of him. There'd be some things that simply we couldn't agree to um, so that government shutdown is technically still on the table. We do not want it to come to that, um, but that option is still open to the president and will remain so. I, I want to pick up because the president tweeted, we'll build the wall one way or the other. And as you pointed out, Mike Pence has also said that over the weekend. What does that mean? Let's, let's say you get $2 billion from the Congress and you agree to that. Can he repurpose money that Congress has appropriated for other purposes and spend that on the wall or does he have to declare a national emergency? Uh, the answer to is, the answer to the question is yes and no. Yes, there are other funds of money that are available to him through what we call reprogramming. There is money that he can get at and is legally allowed to spend. And I think it, it, does, it, it needs to be said again and again that all of this is going to be legal. There are uh, statutes on the books as to how any president can do this. Another, and he can do that without declaring a national emergency? There are certain funds of money he can get to without declaring a national emergency and other funds that he can only get to after declaring a national emergency. How so, much could he get without declaring a national emergency? Uh, that remains to be seen. Let's talk about the whole pot. The whole pot is well north of uh, five, $5.7 billion. Now, it's clear that a lot of Republican leaders, including Senate Majority Leader McConnell, are saying don't declare a national emergency. There'll be a resolution of disapproval. A lot of Republicans are going to break with you. It's such a bad precedent. Right. Is his, does he, is the national emergency, declaring a national emergency, still on the table, or has he been persuaded by some of his fellow Republicans? Let's not go that oh, way. No, it's absolutely on the table. And it's not a precedent, okay? This is the law, the law as it exists today. I think we've had 58 declaration of national emergencies since the National Emergency Act was passed in the 1970s. So th this is not a case, Chris, as many folks think it is, of the president just not getting what he wants, so just going off and magically declaring a national emergency and getting all the money he wants. There are certain things that every president must do in order order to trigger um, the rights that he has to sort of move money around. So, yeah, there's a lot of Republicans who don't want to do it. Face it, the president doesn't really want to do it. That's why we had to go through the shutdown. That's why he's let Congress do what they've done for the last three weeks. He would prefer legislation because it's the right way to go and it's the proper way to spend money in this country. But if that doesn't happen, the president perceives his number one priority is national security. He will then look at the National Emergencies Act as a way to do his job. In his State of the Union address, the president warned about the dangers of illegal immigration. Here he is. Tolerance for illegal immigration is not compassionate. It is actually very cruel. 
But the Washington Post reports this weekend the Trump Golf Club in New Jersey has employed a steady stream of illegal immigrants for years and that the managers at the club knew they were illegal. How do you explain this apparent hypocrisy by President Trump and by his business? One of the things you and I have talked about with my job is what I call compartmentalization, which is that I deal with running the White House, we deal with running the government. What you've just put up, uh, it's a fair question, but it's a question that goes to the Trump organization and not to the Trump White House. We are not involved in the operation of, the, of those facilities. Have you ever, has the president ever discussed the fact that there apparently was this stream of illegals working for him? No, I don't talk with the president about his business. I know that sounds unusual to people, but we have so much to do running the government, we don't get into these other matters. All right. You brought a small group of House members, Republicans and Democrats, to Camp David uh, Friday, Saturday to discuss potential areas for common ground that you could actually do business in. Did you find any? A little bit. I think so. Um, I found out that I can beat John Yarmouth in bowling, even though he beats me in golf. That was fun. But I also found out that John Yarmouth and Peter Welch, good friends of mine, was in the House, are interested in talking about things such as border security, such as uh, uh, drug uh, prescription drug pricing. So yeah, in fact, I think we're going to have at least one meeting this week uh, on drug pricing that grew out of that uh, that get together uh, Friday night. I think we need to do more of that. Spend more time focusing on. If you and I disagree 90% of the time, it means we agree. 10% of the time, maybe our, our time is better spent to try and figure out how to work on that 10%. President Trump said this week in his State of the Union speech that if House Democrats conduct what he called, quote, ridiculous partisan investigations that nothing will get done. I want to play for you some clips from the President, from Intelligence Committee Chair Adam Schiff, and then the Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker at a hearing on Friday. Here they are. If there is going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. We are not going to be intimidated or threatened by the president to withhold any legislative advancement. Have you ever been asked to approve any request or action to be taken by the special counsel? Mr. Chairman, uh, I see that your five minutes is up, and so... Uh... <laughs> Go ahead. Put him, put him, put him. I want to see people to see you laughing at that. Two questions. One, does the president recognize that Congress has a legitimate oversight role in addition to its legislative role and that it's an aggressive legislative role? And two, what did he think of Attorney General Whitaker's behavior in that hearing. The president absolutely uh, agrees with the concept of the, the, that the Congress has the right to do oversight. It's one of their constitutional jobs. That's not his point. He's not trying to discourage them from doing it. What he's saying is, look, you have a choice. We can either work together on legislation or we can spend all of our time with you doing these investigations, but you can't do both. Uh, I'm well, not... Wait, wait. You can do both. No, and, and, and wait a minute. And presidents have done both plenty of times. Right. But don't, you can't, it's not reasonable to expect the president to, to work with you on Monday on a big infrastructure bill and then on Tuesday have you punch him in the face over 15 different investigations. Are, 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 you, were, you were in Congress for six years. Are you aware? I mean, you were. You were sure. there of what uh, the Republicans did to Barack Obama yeah. and Hillary Clinton on Benghazi, on Fast and Furious. Uh, and, and they got some things done, despite the fact that these were aggressive partisan investigations. Well, we, we didn't get very much done. In fact, uh, listen, I would be the first to admit that when, when the Tea Party wave, of which I was one, got here in 2011, the last thing we were interested in is giving President Obama legislative successes. That's where the Democrat Party is right now. The difference between then and now is that so many of these Democrats got here by saying they wanted to reach across the aisle and they wanted to work with the president. A lot of those swing districts folks are in there saying, you know, we're not really interested in those in the investigations we want to work with our friends across the aisle we're giving them a chance to do that what we're telling them is you can't do both you can't go home and tell the voters back home that you're going to work with the president and then come to Washington and do nothing but investigate the president so we're going so to try they want to investigate no oversight no investigations well, if they want to, no, if they investigate, there will be. But that's their no, choice. No, no, I'm saying if they, want to, if they want to legislate, no investigation. It's very difficult to do both. I just think that's, that's human nature. All right. In his speech, I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I want to get through a couple of things quickly. In his speech, the president warned Democrats about socialist policies, and he issued this declaration. Tonight, we renew our resolve that America will never be a socialist country. 
I understand the president opposes the new Green Deal, but does he think that's the, the view of a wing of the party, or does he think that's the prevailing opinion of Democratic leaders? I don't think anybody knows. I think that's one of the big questions of the day is where is the center of gravity in the Democrat Party? Um, you're going to have John Tester on a little bit, who's widely perceived as being sort of a conservative within that party. I'd be curious to know where he is on the Green New Deal. I think that uh, roughly half of the, of the announced presidential candidates for the Democrats have supported this, even though they're not really sure what it is, and the other half have not. So I don't know where the Democrat Party is on this. I know where the Republican Party is. And by the way, it's fun to be in a party when we're united and the other side is divided. We're against the Green New Deal. No, that, that is without any question. That is true. Uh, President Trump has repeatedly gone after Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. And here's a tweet from last month after the National Enquirer reported that Bezos was having an extramarital affair. So sorry to hear the news about Jeff Bozo being taken down by a competitor Who's, and that's the Inquirer, whose reporting, I understand, is far more accurate than the reporting in his lobbyist newspaper, the Amazon Washington Post. Given his support for the Inquirer, how does he feel about Bezos saying that the Inquirer was threatening to blackmail him with intimate photos? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's any question. There's no love loss between the President of the United States and, and, and Mr. Bezos or the Washington Post. But in all fairness, I've never asked him that question. Again, I come back to the point that while these things make news and a lot of the folks in the media are interested in them, it's not what we do in the West Wing. We run are you the government troubled at the, the idea that, that the Inquirer would threaten to expose explicit photos unless Bezos dropped an investigation? Take, take me out of my role as chief of staff, yeah. and I think it's a very interesting question. That the, 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 uh, I think the, the, what little I've read about it was the National Enquirer is, is asserting a First Amendment privilege to do that. Um, Mr. Bezos is saying he's been blackmailed. It's going to be very interesting to, to see that constitutional issue play out in the courts. But it's not the question of whether they have the right. It's that they're saying... If you don't drop your investigation and don't say there's no there's any political motive, we're going to do this. That's a that's would seem to be extortion. Again, yes, and that's the allegation Mr. Bezos has made. You and I are not going to resolve those issues here today. We could try. Anyway, <laughs> final question: How close are you to finding the person or persons who leaked the president's private schedule? And if you do. What are you going to do the, to him or her? Here's why this is important to me as the as the acting chief of staff. The, real, the stuff in the in the memos was not that uh, confidential. About 400 people get that. Um, there's much more private schedules that I see, for example, as the chief of staff. So it's not the content. It's the fact that someone within the um, the the uh, the White House spent three months collecting this information, which is really really hard to do. It, and it also sends, uh, sheds light on the fact that many people who work for us weren't hired for us. It would be like um, Maxine Waters taking over the Financial Services Committee in the House and having to keep Jeb Henseling's staff. We need civil service reform so the president can trust everyone working for him, and we're not there right now. And how close are you to finding who did it? Uh, I'm hoping to have a resolution on that this week. So you're really close? Yes, sir. And when you find that person or persons when it find that person or persons, and it's likely going to be a career staffer, you're going to learn a lot about how hard it is to fire federal workers. You're saying that you may not be able to fire him? I'm saying that uh, it, I know from my work at the uh, CFPB, it's nearly impossible to fire a federal worker. Nick, thank you. Thanks for coming in. I've got to say, I ask you a question, I get an answer. It's always a good time. Always good to talk to you, sir. Thanks.